members of the church, but you go out to church so that you have a better understanding on the purpose of church. Because whether you're in a house or this house, it's about fellowship around the table. Not your table, but God's table. Because he is the one who is going to be faithful to give you what you need. But here's the thing. We can gather today in this place, feasting from the Lord's table. But at the same time, you can go home this week and sit around the table with other believers and non-believers as well. And fellowship and feel and know that the presence of the Lord is there. Somebody asked me one time, and, and I thought this was so interesting. It was a great question. They came up and they said, why is it that I feel so close to God when I go to church, but when I get home, I don't? And I said, it's because when you get home, close the door to the public. Well, you don't understand. I don't have a big house. Well, I didn't tell you that to invite him. You can just invite your neighbor. Have them come over for some fellowship, and as you fellowship, take that opportunity to share your testimony. See, we overthink things to the point where we feel like everything's got to have a protocol. Let's throw out protocol, and let's pursue the presence. Let's pers pursue, as they did, the presence of the Lord, because... They weren't just in any house. She shares that the Medina church was meeting in a Roman satirian officer quarters. And at that time, that was not something that you would normally see. But God didn't come just to save the Israelites. He came to save the church. And I want to encourage you that as we go through this study of the Holy Spirit together, as we talk more about the presence of the Lord, as we talk more about the Trinity, I want to encourage you to take the opportunity to just simply look for ways that you can bring His presence into your home by fellowshipping with your church. And you don't need me to be there. I know there's people who say, well, Pastor, we're going to do this, and so we'd like you to, to, to be there so you can kind of run. No, 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 no. You don't need me. You need him. And if he's in you, if you truly are a believer of God, and you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you are now filled with the Spirit and have the ability to be able to go and testify to, to who he is in such a special way. Amen? Because God did not create his presence to just show up on Sunday morning. His presence is all around us, and we're going to talk about that right so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you would please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll be reading two chapters out of 1 Corinthians. This study that we're doing on the Holy Spirit is actually going to be based on the epistle churches that Paul wrote to, starting with 1 and 2 Corinthians. And I'm not going to read this chapter by chapter. I'm not going to break it down like that. There, You, you can go and do Bible studies on, online or at the library. We even have a study here if you'd like to have to study more out the uh, first and second Corinthians in, in its entirety. But I think it's a message that really what we need to see that Paul was presenting to all of these epistle churches was the fact that they all had issues and the answer was the Holy Spirit. They were missing something when it came to the Holy Spirit. And so, as we talked about last Sunday, we were talking about belief, or the, the Sunday before, we were talking about believing in the Holy Spirit. The importance of believing that the Holy Spirit is real, that the Holy Spirit is a person. Because in order for you to be able to walk with the Holy Spirit, you have to first believe that the Holy Spirit exists. So we talked about that two Sundays ago. 
Today, what I want to talk to you about is the three in one. I want to talk to you not just about walking with the Holy Spirit, but actually how the Holy Spirit ties in to the Trinity, the three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, because sometimes we can misconstrue and think that, well, if we are to walk with the Holy Spirit, then we fully focus on walking with the Holy Spirit, and we pay no attention to Jesus or to the Heavenly Father. And that is not how it's supposed to work. See, it's like a company. If you have a company, you're going to have the CEO, you're going to have the board, and then you're going to have the workers. It takes all three parts of that in order for a company to work. If we take a look at a family, in order for a family to work, first of all, there will be no children unless there's a father and a mother. And then through the father and the mother, then there are the children. And oh, by the way, whether or not we want to recognize it or not, when it comes to the children, there's the eldest, there's the middle, and there's the baby. Our children are now 30, 32, 33, and I think 35. And there's the elder, there's the boys in the middle, and then there's the baby. It hasn't changed after all these years. In fact, it's funny to me that we will get together for family gatherings and they will have a discussion about the ranking of themselves as children and I always love when my youngest comes and leans next to me and says I will always be daddy's baby and the other ones glare at me the truth of the matter is she will be because she was the baby right so when it comes to seeing how things work, we need to understand that God did not just create the Holy Spirit to be here with you and thus ignore everything else about him. No, he wants you to know that you have been blessed with now the ability through Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, to have a relationship with your heavenly Father, which is guided by the Holy Spirit. See, it's a three-in-one process. In other words, we will try sometimes to get through the day with a singular action. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Here's what the Lord showed me. He said, George, how many meals do you eat a day? I said, well, Lord, if we're talking about meat, that would be about eight. And God was like, okay, normal, regular meals. How many? How many? Three. Three. Right? And you have to have at least two because if you just go with just the one, you're going to be very hungry. Right? But at the end of the day, in order for you to, to have a healthy lifestyle, you're encouraged to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So there's a three-part process to you not going hungry. And so when it comes to God and the Trinity, it's not just about believing in the Holy Spirit, but understanding that the Holy Spirit is a part of something even greater. And that's the Trinity. And if we are going to embrace the Holy Spirit for what the Holy Spirit has been sent here for and what he does for us in our lives, then we need to recognize who sent him and how it was made possible through Jesus Christ. Amen? So as we turn into our Bibles today, this is what we are going to be seeing with the Corinthian church because the Corinthian church is influenced, unfortunately, by what is going on in the marketplaces. You see, there were two ports in Corinth. There was a port that pointed towards Italy in the Roman Empire, and there was a port that pointed to Southeast Asia going towards China, and there were all of these influences that were entering into Corinth that came from all of the cities and towns in between these empires, they had a huge influence on this community and on its culture. And unfortunately, what happens is the Corinth church that is established by Paul becomes influenced by commerce, not by Christ. In other words, well, it's, and here's the thing. We say America. No, 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 no. It's everywhere. Cultures are more influenced by their commerce or their lack of commerce rather than Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just talk about Somalia for just a minute. Because of their lack of commerce, they are influenced then to be pirates. To literally get in small boats and go across the bay and attack cargo ships 
that are a hundred times the size of their boat to take off of there what they think is rightfully theirs. So we see this not just in America, but we see this all over the world, how this is commerce and culture influenced the world. And the key was that we needed Christ to break that because commerce and culture will not get you into the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And so we want to pay attention to what it is that God is actually doing for us through his son, Jesus Christ, and by the presence now of the Holy Spirit. So as we turn to 1 Corinthians, please keep in mind that Paul is writing to a church that has been influenced by commerce and culture, not by Christ. And so now he wants to speak into them to remind them of what they need to do. Otherwise, they are going to be swallowed up by darkness and the things of this world. So we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 10. 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 10. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that a person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except through God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so that we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the spirit, using the spirit's words to explain spiritual truth. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God, Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they are not able to understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit is saying or what it means. Those who are spiritual can uh, evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows each to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. So when we are seeking, we are seeking to go, we are seeking to know God more, who is the head of the Trinity. But in seeking to go not to know God more, we need the help of the Spirit to guide us. And in order for that guidance to make sense, you need to have the mind of Christ. Because without the mind of Christ, nothing's going to make sense to you. So as we see the three of them working together, God wants you to understand and for me to understand that every time we walk in Him, it will take us recognizing the three in one, not one on one. Because you need more than just the Holy Spirit. You need the Father, you need His Son, and you need His Spirit. Amen? Now let's continue with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 9 through 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 9 through 16. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field, you are God's temple. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we, have, we already have, which is Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials like gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Do you not realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? recognizing and seeing that there's a foundation laid, which we know is Jesus Christ, that we know that we are the temple of God the Father, 
so that he is able to abide in us and speak into us. And he does that through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let, let me help you with this for just a moment. Recently, we had some plumbing issues here at the church. And we were trying to figure out what was going on. And we did the plunging thing, and we bought the special plungers, and I plunged, and then Laura said, here, let me try it. And then I said, no, babe, you're doing it wrong. Let me get in there and do it. And so for a couple of days, we just plunged every toilet in, this, in, in these two facilities trying to figure out what was going on with them. And the plungers were not working. So then we decided, well, if they're, they're not working, before we call an expert to come here and charge us a bunch of money to tell us what's going on, let's go to um, Ace Hardware and let's see if they have like a declog that we can go and declog whatever's going on and save us some money in that way. So we went to Ace Hardware and when we got to Ace Hardware, they had a whole row of decloggers. Now, some were meant for commercial bathrooms, some were meant for regular bathrooms, some were meant for certain types of toilets and not other types of toilets. Some of them asked questions like, what kind of plumbing do you have? What kind of piping do you have? And we were just sitting there and my brain was just pounding because I'm like, if I don't pick the right one, I'm going to make this problem worse. So my wife and I are having this conversation in Ace Hardware for about 30 minutes about which one we should pick. And finally, I told her, I said, you know what we need, honey? We need an expert. I know we want to try and save money, but the truth of the matter is we don't know what to pour down the toilet. And the last thing I need to do is to call you and say, hey, guys, just want you to let you know, not only are our toilets no longer working, but now we have a permanent fountain spraying through the ceilings of the church because we poured something in it, it bubbled and exploded, and we don't know how to shut it off. So here I am, and I'm saying, babe, you know what? I guess we're going to have to get the experts to give us guidance on what we need to do. And so we called an expert out, and the expert came out, and took a look at everything, and they said, we're going to run a, a camera down these pipes, and we're going to see what's going on. And the guy came, and he ran a camera, and he went, I brought the wrong camera. I can't really get in there and see what I need to see. So then he looked at me, and he says, I think you need to call somebody else, because I think here's what the real issue is. And he told me we had these pumps. And I'm like, pumps, what are these pumps? And he says, what these pumps are, they're underground, you can't see them, but they take everything from the toilets and they pump them into the city something, into the sewage. And he says, I'm thinking that it's probably these pumps. Well, sure enough, we bring the other expert in, we find out that it's the pumps. And so in order for us to have the bathrooms work like they should, we had to have this person go in, fix the pumps. Well, it turns out when they fix the pumps, the alarm that attaches to the pump to tell, talk to the pumps to tell them they're up, it wasn't working. So the guy that fixed the pump said, we got to send somebody else out who can fix this alarm system and make sure that the pumps are being talked to so they know when to pump. And I'm just sitting here thinking, and I was trying to take care of this problem with a plunger. <laughs> And you know what, guys? That's what we do is a lot of times we'll say, okay, today I'll talk to the Father. Tomorrow I'll take it up with Jesus. And on Wednesday I'll talk to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work that way. They work together. And they work together for your good and for my good. So when you are getting up in the morning and saying, thank you, God, for waking me up, you also then need to say, thank you, Jesus, for redeeming me and allowing me to have a relationship where I can directly thank the Lord. And oh, by the way, Lord, I need guidance. So thank you for the Holy Spirit who's going to guide me through this day so that I will honor and glorify you in everything I do. Well, pastor, if we do that, it's going to take time. But here's the truth of the matter. If you don't do it in that way, it won't get done right. See, it's not just about believing in God. It's not just about believing in Jesus. It's not just about believing in the Holy Spirit. It is about believing that they all play a vital role. 
And that means it's going to take time because you're going to have conversations with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I was having a conversation about a month ago with the Lord about something. And as I was having this conversation with the Lord, the Lord stopped me and said, um, have you talked to the Holy Spirit about it? And I was like, hold on, wait a minute. What do you mean have I talked to the Holy Spirit about it? God, I'm talking to you. Lord, I am speaking to you directly. And God is like, but have you talked to the Holy Spirit? So I contacted the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, the Lord said I need to bring this up to you. And when I did, the Holy Spirit said, I will take this and I will give you guidance and instruction on what you need to do. And I'll present it to the Father. I was like, wait a minute, hold on a second. What did I just miss here? Guys, I missed a viable point in understanding what it is that the Holy Spirit does. And what the Holy Spirit does is he's an ambassador to my soul and to my heart. And in other words, what he does is he's that one who comes in and he tells me what my condition is. And what I need to do about that condition. And then he sends a report to the Father. And then what I find out is when I see that my condition has placed me where I am no longer in alignment to what God wants in my life, then I address Jesus Christ the Son by saying, will you take your blood and wash me and forgive me? And thank you, God, that I have the ability to confess my sins. At the end of the day, what I have realized is not only am I not in control of my life, but I've got to talk, talk to more than one person about it. And it's not so that it will cause confusion. It's so that it will bring me to a place of surrender. See, God is more interested in you being able to come a place of surrender because when you surrender, God then is in control. And when God is in control, I no longer worry about whether or not I understand something. I just simply trust God to know that he has my well-being and my life and my plan and purpose in his hands, not mine. Amen? So it's so important for us, guys, to see how this works. So as we get ready to wrap this up, I want to give you three things quickly that are important so you understand how things work when we talk about the Trinity. Number one, it's having a relationship with God. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, they broke off that relationship that they had once had with God, and so now we needed to have a relationship with God, but it wasn't going to happen without help. If you turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 17 and 18 together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And God's word says, God will destroy anyone who destroys his temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scripture says, he traps the wise in the snares of their own cleverness. So understanding that at the end of the day, God is not trying to put you in a place where you don't need him, but rather God is trying to lead you to a place where all you do is need him. Amen? And if we will recognize our sinful condition, if we will realize that we are wretched sinners and that we need God's grace, we need his presence, we need the blood of Jesus, and we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden you don't have time to think about how to control your life because now you are spending your time letting God take control of your life. Amen? Amen? And that's where God wants to put us. He wants us to put us there. Why? So that we can have a relationship with him. Look at Zephaniah 3.17. Zephaniah 3.17. That's in the Old Testament in case you're wondering. Zephaniah 
Zephaniah 3.17. It's such a great word because in Zephaniah 3, what's being written is Jerusalem's rebellion, but also redemption. And that's what I love because the story of the Trinity is in place so that we understand that God not only loves us in our rebellion, but God has a plan to remove it from us. Amen? He's got redemption in place. And look at Zephaniah 3.17. It says here, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take the life in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful song. God wants to have an amazing relationship with you. So there's this understanding of how God works in this trinity and the focus in the trinity is for us to have a relationship with God. Second, a union with Christ. Not only do we need to have a relationship with God, but also a union, unity with Christ. And we see that when we were reading earlier in our scripture passages, that it says that we have the mind of Christ. Also look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Looking at verses 7 through 11. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 11. A relationship with God and a union with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 11. And the word of God says, For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. By the way, I just want to use that scripture passage to let you know that you have never been in control. Either God is in control or your sinful nature is in control, but you are always out of control. And the way you get from out of control is you've got to let God be in control. See, the difference between... <coughs> Sin controlling you and God controlling you is sin wants to take you by your ankle and it wants to fling you around up against the walls, throwing you around, banging you all around, showing no care. God wants to take you and embrace you in his arms. And how does he do this? Watch this as we continue to read. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And it is Christ who lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. And the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. But in order for you to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to live in you, you first have to accept the fact that you cannot have the mind of this world, but you need the mind of Christ, which is opposite of this world. See, when we get into the things of this world, it's not because Christ fails. It's not because God fails. It's not because the Holy Spirit fails. It's because we have made a decision that we would rather be controlled by our flesh and sin than we would by God. I have people who, over the years of ministry, have come to me and said, Hey, Pastor, I just want you to know, I don't see where it says we can't do drugs in the Bible. I don't see where it says that I can't have beer and wine, I see where I'm not supposed to get drunk. Oh, I don't see in here, Pastor, where I have to do this or do that, so do I really have to do it? Here's the thing. If you are asking me why you can't do something, it's because you want to do it. But you don't want to take responsibility. You want to be able to say, well, Pastor said it was okay. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, I am never going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you to open up your Bible and accept what it says or don't accept it. It's up to you. The cost of following God is a whole lot less than the cost that it will co cost you to follow sin and to give it to your flesh. And oh, by the way, I want you to hear this, believer. There is no such thing as a super believer. So there is no believer out there right now that can pray around and go, I can't be touched. I can't be brought down. Because the Bible says, if you have pride, they'll bring you down. Amen. He will humble you. 
See, God is not looking to make super believers. God is looking to make servants who believe. Does that make sense? This is what God wants to do, but it will not happen if you don't have the mind of Christ. And why do we need the mind of Christ? Because the perfect example of service to God was through Christ. Because he had the mind to serve. Those who surrender will have a mind to serve. Those who do not will not serve at all. I love what a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Anthony Torres, out of Albuquerque, said he's he was on his way to the Carolinas. Um, he's part of this uh, uh, food outreach ministry that goes when there's catastrophes. Um, and they go and, and, and they serve food and stuff. And uh, so he was uh, on his way there and from one of the airports as he was on his way there. He did this devotional. And it was so awesome what he said. Because in that devotional he said this. When I was in sin, I gave my all to sin. So now that I'm saved and serving God, should I not give all to him? I mean, that just made perfect sense to me. All of a sudden, I'm going, well, hello. If I gave sin everything I had, then now that I'm serving God, should not I want to give him everything I have? I don't need to look for loopholes to be able to do things that the Holy Spirit has told me are not good for me. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, listen to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is trying to bring you into obedience to God. You have to have, though, this union with Christ. Write these references down. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. And then 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. Now, if, if you're trying to keep up with notes or whatever, I do want to let you know if you have the church app. Uh, my sermon notes are on there on the church app, and you can access my, my message as well as these verses. But again, Galatians 2.20 and 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. So let me close with this. A relationship with God, a union with Christ and a indwelling with the Holy Spirit. A relationship with God, a union with Christ, and an indwelling with the Holy Spirit. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20. Now, here's the interesting thing I want to talk to you about when it comes to the indwelling. Okay. So, There is a lot of stuff in pastor's house. And I'm not going to point at my wife and say it's all hers. Though most of it is. But some of it's mine. Some of it's mine too. Right? But when, when we up brought everything from Las Cruces to come here, we put everything in the garage. And then as things got moved into the house... Less and less boxes were appearing in the garage. Except for the fact that when we got done unpacking everything that we could unpack, my wife looked in the garage and said, there's no room in here for my car. You need to fix it. I'm like, wait, what? She says, you need to fix it. Now, here is pastor's way of fixing things. If there's no room, I throw out everything until there is room. I just get rid of stuff. I know, whatever, you know. That's not how it works in my wife's heart. Because she tells me, before she goes to work, she just got a job, so she's going to work. She tells me, she says, I know what you're thinking. You cannot get rid of anything, but my car needs to fit in this truck. And I was like, oh, Lord, how are we going to do this? Here's what happened. I literally had to move every box that was left in the garage and put it in the driveway. And so I did. And there was so much in the driveway, people were stopping and saying, hey, are you having a garage sale? I'm like, yeah, maybe. no, 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 no. I hear her voice. 
And I know this about Laura. I can look at those boxes and think there's no way that she knows. She does. She knows. Right? But the goal is to put the car into the garage. And so I moved everything out of there. And I began to look at the garage. And I began to think about how I can put things and how I can get the car into the garage. And that's when the Holy Spirit spoke to me about what we do with our lives. We have so much junk in the temple that when God comes and says, I want to impart my spirit upon you, instead of us making room, we tell him there is no room. <coughs> do you remember when he was born? Jesus is coming. The Messiah is on the way. The angels have just seen the shepherds and they glorify God in the highest. Not the innkeeper. I'm sorry. There's no room here. Because he didn't recognize who wanted to come in. In other words, what I'm saying is God wants to impart the Holy Spirit in you. The reason he's not is because you didn't make room. And in order to make room, you're going to have to take everything out of your heart. And then only put back. What God tells you. But what we want to do is we want to keep everything. And so we're like, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to make a space, right? And that's what I did. I'm going to make a space for the car. And Laura pulled the car into the garage. And then she called me. I'm standing there while she pulls in the car in the garage. And she calls me on her cell phone. And I'm like, yeah, babe. She's like, I can't get out of the car. <laughs> I'm like, roll the window down and climb out. I don't want to mess with this anymore. See, but the focus is, it's not about just letting the Holy Spirit move in, but you've got to make room so the Holy Spirit can move in you. So it's a relationship with God. It's a union with Christ. And it's an impartation of the Holy Spirit in you. And when people say, well, I just don't feel like the Holy Spirit is working. It's because he's still in the car. He doesn't have room to get out. You need to go in and you need to say, God, show me what I need to move so that the Holy Spirit can begin to move. We rely on music. We rely on the pastor's message. We rely on the church setup. We rely on special speaker. Did you hear the special speaker? And pastor, we'll bring this special speaker in. I mean, I had a gentleman who called me one day, and he's like, Pastor, do you have a desire for revival in your church? I said, I have a re desire for revival in people's hearts. And he said to me, he goes, well, it's going to have to start with the church service. And by the way, he said, I'm an expert at that. All you have to do is pay me $2,000. And I'll come down there, and I guarantee you that there'll be a revival. And I told this man, I said, you can't guarantee that. Because in order for you to guarantee that, you would have to know the heart of every person in that building. And so I hung up the phone on him. And he'll never come to this church. Guys, I am telling you that revival does not start here. It starts in you. Take a look at the scripture very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Here is Paul talking to the Corinthian church, who, by the way, is doing immoral things, who is living by the world's standards. They are entertaining people. People are coming to the church of Corinth because it's got the big spotlight and it's got the fog machines and they're singing music that touches people's hearts. And nobody is paying attention to what is missing, which is the presence of God. The presence of His Spirit. Because if God is not present, His Spirit won't be present. And if His Spirit won't be present, neither will His Son. And so right in here, He's like, do you not understand that you are the temple? <clears throat> and it is the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. 
You do not belong to yourself. Would you take right now your finger, don't point it at your neighbor, <coughs> point it at you, and say, I don't belong to me. I don't, don't belong, belong to me. You don't belong to yourself. <coughs> you belong to God. Which, oh, by the way, you didn't build this temple that you did. Amen. And we disrespect the God who built this temple by the things that we put in it. <coughs> it's time, if we want to see the Holy Spirit move in us, forget moving all across the world. It's going to do that anyway. But if we are going to see the Holy Spirit of God move freely throughout our community, he's got to move freely first. So it's time for us to check the crotch. Maybe you have the Holy Spirit in it, but is the Holy Spirit able to get out? Thank you, sister. An indwelling of the Holy Spirit. An indwelling with the Holy Spirit. So what does a relationship with God and a union with Christ have to do with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, church? Everything. Absolutely everything. We know Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says that he has a plan and purpose for your life. Did you ever stop to realize that the plan and purpose comes through the Spirit of God? The reason we have so many people, especially young people in the world today, that are walking around with no direction in their life is because they don't have the Holy Spirit in their life. But they cannot have the Holy Spirit in their life if Jesus Christ is not their mind. And in order to be, to have the mind of Christ, he's got to be their Lord and Savior. And without Jesus as Lord and Savior, you won't have the Holy Spirit indwelling, and more importantly, you will not have a relationship. So what's most important to us? What is most important to us? Is it to truly have a relationship with God, a union with Christ, and an indwelling with the Holy Spirit? Genesis chapter 6. Genesis <coughs> chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. This is the time of Noah. This is the time when everything on this planet is gone wrong. In fact, my Bible right now that I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, it's titled, A World Gone Wrong. Would you say that we're still living in that world today? Absolutely. But even in a world gone wrong, can I tell you there's hope for this world? So I want you to read what the you see what the verse says. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. And the sons of God saw these beautiful women, and they took of them and as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with, uh, with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, uh, giant Nephilites lived in the earth, for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with the women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. And the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally pure. The reason, guys, that I read this to you as believers, is this is for believers right now. The reason that I read to you this as believers is because it's important for you to know the condition of your flesh. This is your flesh. Oh, and by the way, as long as you're breathing, your flesh, your flesh breathes. Aren't you thankful we don't take this with us? Aren't you thankful that we have promised the body, a perfect body, right? Guys, it's not just about what doesn't work on your body. It's not just about how broken you may feel physically. It's more important for you to know that this flesh wants to consume you. And the answer to not being overcome by your flesh is having a relationship with God, a union with Christ, and an indwelling 
with the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads? Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, God is with us and his power is all around us. When will we actually see it? Max Lucado said, God is always near us. He's always for us and he's always in us. May we forget him. We may forget him at times, but God never forgets us. We live in a hopeless world, but that doesn't mean there isn't hope. We have hope. Because of Jesus. We have hope because of the love of God. We have hope because the Spirit of God is among us. But we got to believe in all three and interact with all three. Tonight we're going to have a prayer meeting here. I want to encourage you, you to be here tonight. Please come tonight. Our community needs Jesus, but we need to pray and get ready to reach this community. A part of our preparation, so I'm inviting all of you, please, if you can be here, please come to this. Because it's part of our preparation to go out and take the gospel to this community. But right now, it's about what is it in your garage that is keeping the Holy Spirit pinned down and not moving freely? The Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the thing. While that is for the unbeliever, it's also for the believer because sometimes we forget. And I truly believe that today the Spirit of God wants to remind you that you are not your own, that you did not build the temple. That it is God who has done it. But can God be honored and glorified in what he teaches us? And I'm not just talking about the things of this world, like pornography and money, those types of things, TV and, and all of those things. I'm not saying that, but I, I want to take this deeper. I'm talking about malice. I'm talking about bitterness. I'm talking about anger. I'm talking about unforgiveness. I'm talking about lying. I'm talking about cheating. I'm talking about your thoughts being focused on greed. Those are the things we're talking about. More importantly, the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to us about. Guys, we don't just need a physical cleanse, we need a supernatural. So right where you are right now, you're going to take a moment as the music begins to play. I want you to take a moment with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want you to get real with them and say, okay, what is still in my life that should be? What is holding me back from the true joy and peace and love that God wants me to